Let's talk about gauge design. This is one of the most important concepts in GDT or manufacturing in general. So let's go back to our shelf. We're going to make thousands of these things, right? And we need to make sure that no matter which ones we pick off the assembly line, you know, they could, they could go on either end, whatever it is. You need to make sure that they're always going to fit together. So let's say that I've got somebody on one side of the room making these on a drill press, milling machine, whatever the heck it is, drilling these holes. And I got somebody on the other side of the room making these things. And of course I'm drilling holes and putting pegs in there, but uh, we're just going to focus on the size of the, and position of the peg for now. We'll get into more detail on that later. Anyway, let's say we've got people making these things, and they're making them, and they're making hundreds of them in an hour, and they want to know, am I making good parts? Because you're not going to find out until you go to the assembly that you go, oh, wait a minute, these things won't go together for, for some reason. So it's helpful to have something that they can check the parts at the machine. And if you're new to manufacturing, an instinctual thing to do is go, oh, well, I'm just going to grab, I'm just going to borrow one of these parts from the person making these things and I'll keep it at the machine where I make these guys. And so every once in a while, every five or ten parts, I'm just going to take one and go, hey, it fits, great. And they keep going. And maybe the person that's making these things says, hey, give me one of those, I can keep at my station. And maybe every 20 parts, every 30 parts, depending on how confident they are in their process, they go, oh, hey, good. The, uh, my, my one part that I, that I borrowed still fits, so I must be in print. Bad idea. And here's why. When we go to inspect these things, first thing we do is we're going to check the size of these holes. And you'll have something called a go-no-go -go gauge. And if you've been doing manufacturing for any length of time, you've dealt with those forever, so bear with me. Go-no-go -go would be, if I, if I took this over to the lathe and... and turn two different diameters on it, I'd have the one that's that matches the smallest that that hole can ever be. And so we verify that it goes in. So if the hole's too small and it won't go in, like, whoops, my, my go side won't go in, so my holes are too small. And that's not position or anything, it's purely size. Then the other side is bigger and it is just slightly bigger than the biggest that that hole is supposed to be. And it's not supposed to go. So you have a go side and a no-go side that won't go in. And that's how you can just check the sizes on that thing. So that's how we check size. And then, well, the reason we check size is because there's always variation. So that drill bit that we're using, even if we're using that drill bit to drill wood, but especially if we're using it to drill metal, it's going to wear the drill bit out and it's going to get smaller by the end of the shift than it was at the beginning. So those holes are going to get progressively smaller. And it's the same thing with, uh, with the pegs that whether we're, use, whether we're interpolating and milling around it, uh, in that case as that end mill, as that tool wore, the peg would get bigger. Um, it would be the same case turning them on a lathe, I guess, as the lathe tool got worn the thing would grow. So this is going to be bigger at the end of the shift than it is at the beginning. So if I'm making these and I grabbed one of those that was at the beginning of the shift with a brand new sharp tool and the guy said, okay, I'm going to set the machine to make these small because I know my, my lathe tool is or my end mill, whatever, is going to wear and this thing's going to grow. Let's say I grab one of those when it's at its smallest and I'm using that to check my tool. And, or to, to, to check these parts. That's the one that I've got. And then my drill bit wears and my holes get smaller. And because I have the one with the smallest pegs, one of the one with smaller pegs, they're going to fit just fine. Or maybe my machine gets bumped and my holes are now slightly more close together. But because I'm using a part with, small, with pegs on the smaller end, it still goes in and I think I'm making good parts. And then a couple days later, depending on how long it takes for my uh, my bin of finished parts to get to assembly, uh, 
hey, these things won't go together. Or worst case, we're making these things for a place like Ikea, like I said, in, in less than one, and people are taking them home and nothing's fitting. And uh, customer service is getting phone calls left and right. Hey, the shelf you sold me won't go together. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a disaster. So it's really important that we get our gauge design right. So the person making these, as soon as the gauge, uh, as soon as the part is out of print or out of, you know, where it's not going to work anymore, the gauge will tell us because it won't go in there. Or if you do, uh, uh, well, we won't worry about the no-go on this kind of thing. It's just make sure that it's going to go together. So how do we do that? It's really simple. We go back to lesson one in our virtual circle. So if you remember from lesson one, if you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. We talked about the fact that, uh, where were those things? We talked about the fact that uh, as our, if we're trying to hit a bullseye and our feature is moving around so the center of it is still on that bullseye, we end up creating this virtual circle. And it's basically, the easiest way to say it, it's worst case. It's the worst case of the biggest peg that is the most out of location that it can possibly be. So we grow these pegs as, as big as the size tolerance on the print will let us do, and then move them as far apart and as close together as possible. It ends up creating a worst case boundary that is the technical term is virtual condition. I just try to call it virtual circle there. Uh, but that is the worst case boundary for this part. And it's the same thing for the hole that it's going to be, of course, the smallest hole size because, again, our hole size and our peg size will vary. So it's the smallest hole size. But then these are also pushed the furthest apart and the closest together. And those create a the same virtual circle as well and that virtual so here's the the blue hopefully you can see that color the blue is the uh, nominal no not the nominal it is the uh, maximum donut condition if you go back and watch my donut video I think that was lesson three uh, the hole in the donut is the smallest so that's the maximum donut or maximum material so the blue is that smallest hole and then the red is our bullseye from the target, so how accurately we can hit. And all you have to do is take that, uh, that smallest hole, the blue, subtract the bullseye from it, and you get the, your virtual circle. You get that smallest hole and the, uh, the, the target that you have to commit to, the size of the bullseye. It will never violate that virtual condition boundary. And on the peg, it's the same, the same thing, that it's the biggest peg, and that's the plus, but it's plus the bullseye instead of subtracting the bullseye to get that virtual boundary. And if you take that virtual condition boundary, that virtual circle, and apply it to both parts, they will always go together. I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Go back and, and watch that. Uh, hopefully lesson one help, helps explain that that was the goal of it. So, that virtual condition boundary is what you make the gauge to, okay? So, I'm going to make, for these parts, I'm going to make a gauge that looks just like this. I probably should have made one of these in rattle canned it metal, so it looked like a rattle canned it silver, so it looked like metal. And I'm going to make, I'm going to put those pegs, I'm going to use the most accurate machine I, I possibly can so that the pegs are exactly on center or as close to it as, as could be made. And I'm going to set those peg diameters to the, in this case, the virtual circle is the same on both sides. Uh, you can, you can play with that in design and make one slightly bigger than the other if you want to. But in this case, I'm just considering, considering them the same size. But when I'm inspecting this part, designing a gauge for this part, I'm going to make pegs that are, are the size of this virtual condition circle, and they have to be just right on center 
and then we put this thing together and that that's uh, that ends up being a gauge for this and the same thing when I'm making these parts I'm gonna make a gauge that looks exactly like this but I'm gonna make the holes the size of that virtual circle and again I'm gonna make sure they are exactly in the middle if we don't spend a bunch of time and effort in uh, making very accurate gauges. One of the things that we can run into is having a gate is is having uh, multiple gauges. You know, you end up losing. You always want to have multiple gauges because you lose one, somebody walks off with it, it gets damaged. You want to have another one sitting there, or you have multiple machines and have one sitting at each machine. But sooner or later, you get into a situation where, hey, boss, these two gauges, this gauge says I use this gauge and check this part and it says it's a bad part, but I pick up this other gauge, or maybe the other end or something, and it says it's good. I've got two gauges that don't agree with each other. And that's what happens if you don't use super precise equipment to make your gauges. They have to be as close to perfect as possible. The other thing to consider in gauge design is, hey, if I'm making this thing exactly perfect, do I make it exactly to the size of this virtual condition circle or do I make it slightly smaller or slightly bigger and you're down to the accuracy of the machine whether it's fractions of a millimeter or fractions of a, a thousandth of an inch you've got to answer that question and the thing that you're deciding is do am I okay accepting a few bad parts into the stream and if we say absolutely not you'll have you'll have managers or whatever saying no I do not want any bad parts making it in to the uh, making it out to the customer and that's yeah hey that's great but to get that you are going to have to size your gauge to be slightly larger than the virtual condition boundary and by doing that you're going to reject a few good parts you can't get away from it it's one or the other you're either going to accept a few bad parts with your gauge or you're going to reject a few good parts you, it's impossible to nail it right and and only only have the good and only reject the bad so that is a decision you have to make and look at the consequences of the design okay does that mean these are just gonna you know if it's something like this hey they'll just be a little bit tougher going together and most people are gonna be able to do it and the customers aren't really going to care, okay, then maybe we'll accept a few bad parts. But there you have it. That is the fundamental of gauge design. And you, you have to get this right because somebody can you know, accidentally bump a machine or they're a little rough with it and they just keep making parts. And if you're just using a mating part, to make sure that oh they go together just fine something in your process is going to drift and pretty soon things aren't going to assemble you're going to have all this work in process that is junk that you're going to have to scrap or rework which is super expensive either way uh, so yeah get that gauge design nailed down and save yourself a lot of trouble